So now what? We celebrated Easter two Sundays ago. And already it feels like so much longer than that for me. To be honest with you, I was feeling a bit of a malaise as we were approaching Easter. There was so much business to do just before Easter, and then lots to do after it. And I'm sure for you it was the same for many of you. For me, yes, the business of the wider church, not just UCC, but the Presbyterian church. But you probably had work to do. You probably had families to care for. You have papers to write and exams to study for. In fact, many of the students aren't here today because you were And for those who are here, I'm grateful. And then in between Easter and today, we had the awe and wonder of the eclipse, a reminder of what people that first Good Friday witnessed. And all of that seems, seems so long ago now to me. It sometimes feels as if we're just plodding along to the next thing. And yet, and yet we are called to believe that something is different than before. We are called to believe that something changed when Jesus died and our Christ was resurrected. But how many of us who have been Christians for a long while really truly feel that way? How many of us really believe that something is different? And how many of us act that way? During Holy Week, we tell ourselves, Friday is here, but Sunday is coming. But when Sunday comes, and the alleluias fade, and the Easter lilies lose their bloom, and we'll take the white cloth off the cross, we might find ourselves asking, so what? Now what? How are we called to live? How is this any different? In the midst of our busyness, in the midst of things we have to do and sermons we have to write and assignments you have to write and, and work that has to be done and people we have to take to a hospital. What are we going to do now? Is it back to the grind as usual? Do we carry on with carrying on? What does the resurrection mean for us on Tuesday coming? What will it mean for us two Fridays from now? What will it mean for you a month from now? Does it affect the way you interact with each other? Does it affect the way you choose to spend your money and your time? Does it affect the way you talk to each other? As followers of a risen Christ, we're called to be different. Not in the way that says, oh, you're supposed to be impossibly perfect. Not in the way that you shame somebody because you think they are sinning. No, as followers of Christ, we're called to discern where God is present in our lives and the lives of others. And we're called to be present for ourselves. We're called to look where God is present in ourselves and in others in a way that does this, that reflects the reality of God's hope. So what now? How do we live in a way that does that without impossibly checking off rules that people have told us we need to check off to be good Christians? Well, the author of this letter, let's call them John, although it's probably not John that wrote this letter. The author of the letter reminds us that we're starting at the beginning of Scripture, that what he is telling us is something we have always known from the beginning. He says, we declare to you what was from the beginning. And the beginning is a very good place to start, start because not only does it make for a good song lyric while you're sitting on a hill having a picnic, but it reminds us that God was, see, some of you got that joke, right? Okay. <laughs> Sound of music, people. <laughs> it was and always will be, God in the beginning was and always will be a God of fellowship. God was and always will be a God of community. That simple sentence, we declare to you what was in the beginning, reminds us God has never been a God of only the individual or only a particular group of people, or only a particular place or a particular country. God has always been a God of all people. And that's an important thing to remember, especially these days, when you hear talk about fulfillment of God's will for one group of people to dominate another group of people or a country. Then John lets us know this is not just history books. 
This isn't just something that happened in the beginning that you can tuck away under your bed and dust out as you need. He says, we declare to you all is from the beginning, yes. So this isn't new information. This is the God of Abraham, and this is the God of Isaac, and this is the God of Jacob. This is the God of Moses. This is a very good place to start. But in addition, this is what we are telling you. We have heard it. We have seen it with our eyes. We have looked at it. We have touched it with our hands. This is real. This is as real as you are today. This message concerning the word of, and he says, the word of life, even that is something we just have to stop and pause on for a while. This is, this is the word of life. Don't just pass it by. This is not the word of condemnation. This is not the word of punishment or wrath. This is the word of life where all people are treated as loved by God. How do we know this? Because they saw it. Because they heard it. They heard Jesus for themselves. This is not speculation. This is what Jesus wanted for all people and for all who followed and heard him, who saw him preach it and live it out as well. John repeats his message to get this eyewitness testimony fact across to them. This isn't some theory that they came up with. He has to repeat it. And I get that. Because sometimes we need to hear something more than once before we get it. We need to get it repeated to us because we can miss something if somebody doesn't say it to us more than once. If you work in a church, the long-standing joke is somebody comes up to you and says, well, I didn't know that was going to happen. And you say, well, I've announced it five times already. Right? Yes, if you work in a church, you get that. But I'm sure it happens in other instances too. I personally miss stuff in an email, and then I have to go back and see that I did miss it. You miss something when you get instructions um, for papers to write. If you're a TA, I'm sure that you've account encountered students who missed what the assignment was required, required. We miss things. And so John repeats his message. He says this is life, not condemnation. Life was revealed to them through Jesus. They were there. They saw it. And now John is calling all the Jesus followers to let other people know about it. So not that they can make their nation great again. Not that they can be dominant over another people's but to have life. And some people will say, well, this is about eternal life. You're missing the point. It is. It is about eternal life. But it's more than that. Listen to what John continues to say. You know, I wonder if John, and most likely he was probably a scribe, maybe John couldn't write, so he was dictating it and somebody was writing it. I wonder if the scribe was getting tired of writing the same thing over and over again. Can you imagine the scribe writing this letter for John? They must have been so exasperated. We have seen and we have heard. Okay, John, we get it. You have seen and you have heard. We have seen and we have heard. Yes, John, you have seen and you have heard. We have seen and we have heard. But John is beating that drum because he wants to make it clear. This is not some academic pondering. This is not some theologian in an armchair coming up with this. They have seen it. They have heard Jesus. We declare to you once again what we have seen and heard. Yeah, yeah, yes, John. What have you seen? What have you heard? Is it, la is it power? No. Is it riches? No. Is it control? No. Instead, it's something that seems so simple, so ordinary. It's fellowship. It's a two-fold fellowship. It's a relationship with each other, which ultimately means a relationship with God. We are meant to have both those things in our lives. We're meant to have a relationship with God and a relationship with each other. If we only focus on eternal life, friends, we're missing the mark. We are not doing what God has wanted us to do. And if we only focus on each other and we ignore our relationship with God, then we're deceiving ourselves because we do need God. It's so easy to focus on one or the other, but we're called to both. We're called to spend time creating a community that reflects God's reality in the here and now. And we're called to have a relationship with God. We're called to be a community of faith. 
And despite what North American society has taught us, we're not called to stop at the me and Jesus relationship. Yes, a personal relationship with Jesus is needed, but an authentic relationship with the risen Christ means fellowship with each other. We're to turn that me and Jesus journey into an us, and then turn this community into one that humbly seeks justice, that helps each other, that uplifts each other, and we keep each other's dignity. We are called to walk with each other. We are called, our community is called, to reflect God reality. Our Easter faith is only ongoing when we do that. Our Easter faith becomes visible and tangible in how we support, encourage, and truly live alongside one another. John is calling us to be in authentic fellowship. We will, we will walk with each other, recognizing that we are all sinners. And gosh, that makes us cringe to think about that today, doesn't it? Because we hear that word sinners, and we remember that we have been taught that we are no good. That's not what God intended. That's not what it, is, it means when we confess we are sinners. To say we are sinners means we acknowledge we are not God. We have, we have acted wrongly against each other and God. But still, we are these beautiful creations of God, made in God's image. To say that we are all sinners recognizes that no one person is better than another. The other thing that we never think about is the communal aspect of sin. We are called to acknowledge that we have done wrongs as individuals, but also collectively as failures. We are failures. There's systemic racism. There's environmental degradation. There's economic exploitation. We confess where we have stayed silent when we should have spoken up and vice versa. We confess we have been afraid to speak up for the vulnerable, like the people in Gaza. We confess that we have been afraid to say that we believe that this is wrong. When we confess what we know is wrong, it becomes a powerful act of truth-telling in community, where honesty about the past and present opens up pathways for healing and transformation. When we recognize our complicity in systems of harm, then we become committed to restorative actions of justice. Now, the author in this letter, he's using light as his metaphor to describe the relationship with Jesus. But we can use other metaphors. We consider the metaphor of vines growing, perhaps, because they give the same idea. They, it's about nurture and interconnectedness and organic development. It emphasizes that we're supposed to be supporting each other and connected with each other. In fact, this whole letter is an ecosystem of faith where each person contributes to the health of the whole. Your faith and my faith, it's not supposed to be in isolation. It's supposed to be a collective movement towards God's light, even as we enjoy moments alone. So now what? How do we live? Do we plod along? Do we just go from Sunday to Sunday and live our lives in between? I don't think so. I think you and me and Leland and Brenda and Paul and Caroline and everyone here, we're called to be a community that reflects God's reality. We're called to make our decisions on how we spend our money, our individual and church money, based on the ecosystem that reflects God's reality. We're to consider how we spend our time based on reflecting God's reality. We are supposed to act on what we profess we believe. And will we make mistakes? Of course we will. Will we fall short? Most likely. But that does not mean we're not walking in the ecosystem of faith. This walk is more than about personal morality. It's more about, it's not so much about where you have sinned as, as a person, where you've fallen short, short. It's about encompassing social justice, advocating for the marginalized, dismantling structures of inequality, we confess our sins, we acknowledge our biases, we shed them, and we listen to God and to each other around us. This is fellowship. This is faith fellowship. It's more than just socializing over coffee and cake, although I don't ever want those to go away. This is about mutual commitment. 
to live in our gospel values, to champion dignity and worth for all individuals. That reflects God's reality. May we as a church continue to be that way, because friends, I think we are already that way. But in this ecosystem of faith, we're invited to consistently ask ourselves, are we ensuring the liberating truth of the gospel is evident, not only in what we preach, but in our deeds? Do we see it in the decisions we make as individuals and as a community? Do the people out there see it in us? Because those are all part of the now what questions. So now what? I think John is inviting you and me to experience faith authentically, foster inclusiveness, foster transformative fellowship, engage in communal confession as a step towards social healing and justice. We are invited into this ongoing transforming reality that the resurrection brings. That is Easter hope. And it means we're supposed to see it in all aspects of our lives. And when one of us can't, we lift up the other. The painting on the scene is John Swan's Peaceable Kingdom. That's the name of it. He created it in 1994. And Icons, the website that I grabbed this from, says it's one of his most popular images. And it embodies one of the central themes of his art. It's the hope that people can live in harmony, basing their lives on Christian values of kindness, love, and peace. It's actually a visual illustration of Isaiah 11, 6 to 8, which says the wolf shall live with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the lion and the fat thing together, and a little child shall lead them. But I think it also applies to our passage for today. It depicts fellowship and community that reflects God's reality. And I thank God that each one of you here is here because you want this community to be one that reflects that reality. I'm ever so grateful that you allow this community to be that way. And I pray that we will always discern that the Holy Spirit is moving us and that we can respond in kind so that we can continue to answer the question, now what? Amen.